welcome back to the Leo Perez show. I'm very happy to have another special guest, a good friend, a very interesting person, Jose Alfredo de Bastos. He's a Venezuelan journalist and political scientist. He studied journalism at the UCV and worked for several media companies. Um, and also he worked in the presidential campaign of Enrique Capello Zaragozki. The UCV is the Universidad Central de Venezuela. He studied political communication at Universidad Complutense. Nowadays, he's located in Washington, D.C., where he studied political science uh, at American University. He currently works for a political risk management company. And he is the host of the podcast La Venezuela Global with Mariano Alba. And it's a program focused on political issues in Venezuela. Okay, Jose, welcome to the show. How are you, man? Good, good, Leo. Thank you for having me. A pleasure. How is everything going in your life now with the coronavirus lockdowns and all of that? Well, good, good. Very busy now having to be worker and 24-hour father uh, as well. So. <laughs> there is a lot of risk uh, management to be done right now, right? <laughs> all, <right. laughs> like, all, all over the place. You specialize in Latin America in your work? Yeah, but the, the Americas as a whole, but I mean, mostly, I guess, yeah, Latin America, Mexico, Venezuela, Colombia. Yeah. Awesome. You know, I wanted to start today with a question that somebody dropped us in... Uh, in the podcast in the in a previous episode of the podcast and before i carry on with you i just want to drop a little bit of a of a monologue just quickly that goes like this for example i was a person who comes from a family that had no immediate major needs in the sense that we were not members of the poor class and so i grew up in a country in which a leftist revolution started and took over the hearts of the soul of the country. And I, as a person who did not need it, the results of that revolution, I myself was voting for it because I was thinking like, oh, in the early days, I was thinking like, oh, come on, this is a poor country and people need help. And obviously the government should not be bent towards somebody like me who has all the needs sorted. Uh, but this very quickly turned into something very different than what was initially promised. One of our audience members, Uh, from England asked the question why is why do you call Venezuela socialist and I was wondering if you meet a person like this and you would like to explain kind of like a brief history of what happened in the promise that Chavez gave versus what happened in the end how would you lean this conversation how would you take this conversation yeah well actually I, I was watching your your show your interview with with Daniel Sierra uh, and you I think you, he, he touched on it a, a little bit Uh, the fact that Venezuela has always been a, a strong state, has always had a strong state, at least, you know, in the past century, at least, mostly due to oil revenue, right? Uh, and so, it, it, in a way, you could say that Venezuela for decades has been a, a sort of socialist, at least social democracy, in which, uh, you know, there's no major taxation. Uh, the government has always helped the poorer people. And, you know, the, we had we, we have uh, free health care, a free education. I mean, of course, the Did quality of that is... we have free health care and free education before Chavez? Yeah, for, for sure. I mean, and, and, and you know, I, I can go back to, to my to my father's story because me, just, just like you, I didn't grow up having any major needs. I had everything, you know, covered, fortunately. But my father was just a, the son of a... Well, he was born in Portugal, uh, the son of a poor Portuguese immigrant, right? And so my father came in to Venezuela without speaking Spanish mm -hmm. and he went to free... Uh, elementary school, free high school, free university, became a doctor. And then, you know, all of his family, his four kids are middle class people, thanks to the structure that Venezuela had in the 50s, 60s and 70s. So, I mean, nobody's going to tell me that, you know, free healthcare was something created by Chavez. No, <laughs> my not only my father studied in a free university, he then became a doctor and for 30 years provided healthcare services for free. In the, at the UCV hospital, at the university hospital. So th that has always been there. And having that doesn't make you a socialist, it doesn't make you a socialist country. Um, I think the difference with Chavez in the past, uh, with Chavismo, I guess, in the past 15 to 20 years has been even more specific issues in which the government has taken over uh, many major industries, right? Not only the oil, which could, you know, People could argue, well, if you own, if the state owns the biggest industry in the country, it's already, you know, pretty socialist, I guess. <laughs> uh, but not only that, the state wanted to do everything, right? So they wanted to handle the food industry. They, they, they took over every, or at least tried to take over a lot of, of industry. And beyond that, I think that the, the key parts of the socialist Venezuela were really uh, price control and uh, 
dollar exchange control, right? Like one you, of the, you cannot freely. Yeah. Excuse me. One of the things I answered to him, I just quickly answered to him when I was actually coming to record this podcast with you, and yeah. and one of the things I answered to him was that I was once driving uh, in, near El Palito which is one of the major oil refineries in the world, the biggest oil refineries in the world. And there was a gigantic sign that said, Patria, Socialismo, o Muerte. So, right. I, I mean, apart from the fact that it has been self-proclaimed a socialist country, right. <laughs> and I, you know what I thought in that moment? I thought, I don't think I will ever see the word Muerte, which it translates for death, printed so large in my whole life. <laughs> I don't think right. it's possible. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And I mean, the, the first key would be, well, I mean, the government keeps telling us we are socialists, right? The name of the of the ruling party is the United Socialist Party. Uh, but but I mean, obviously, price control again and, and, and exchange control, but also, I mean, not only oil, but then the government basically controls all the transport, uh, you know, the, the subway, it's, it's state owned, state operated. And then they have the, the telephone companies, electricity, water. Uh, parts of that, at some point of our recent history, were uh, private, and then, but but Ch Chavismo basically took them over. And then you know you have like TV stations, you have tourism companies. So so most of the of the economy in Venezuela is handled by the state. Uh, and so there was a period of time where where this was you know exacerbated, where government just took over land and land from people and they didn't even really pay them, right? Which this was Chavez uh, times or before Chavez. No, no, it was Chavez. I would say after the 2006 election, he really, you know, went went hard on that. He he already had, of course, you know, far left ideas or dreams, and he was always well connected to to, to Cuba, right? He was friends with with Fidel Castro. But after 2006, where he says, "Hey, I have all the power, uh, I have all the popularity, I have all the money, uh, I'll just do what I want," right? And so people are not going to be mad because I have money to make them happy to keep them happy while I take over everything. Ten years later, or eight, seven to eight years later, we saw the, the results of that major takeover. Where do you think are the political factions in Venezuela, if there is something like that? Because it all seems pretty uniform. I mean, there is like Chavismo and anti-Chavismo. That's a very obvious yeah. demarcation. But where are the political factions there, if you may, you know... I mean, it's a hard question. During the the forty years that we had of, of democracy, that you also discussed with with Daniel, I mean, yeah. the two part, the two major parties, uh, which you could theoretically theoretically say, you know, this it was the center right and the center left, they were really very much to the left, both of them. I mean, Cope, exactly. which was the the Christian Democratic Party, that in a you know, centrist center right uh, in Venezuela was always really you know pro uh, state, uh, let's say state led. Um, economy, right? Uh, I was, I mean, recently reading some some books of Venezuelan history, and, and many times they voted against any type of private uh, companies taking anything of the oil industry. Something that the, the center left party at some point proposed, Cope opposed it in Congress. So, so uh, I, I mean, there's there's always been more, maybe a, a bit more conservative uh, thinking within some people that at some point were, were uh, expressed in Cope. I mean, there was a, a bit more, you know, closeness to to the Catholic Church, uh, things like that, right? And maybe, you know, more respect for traditions and somehow. I think now things have changed. I think Chavismo has created uh, a stronger right wing, I would think, right? If, if we ever have, you know, like a normal democracy in a few years, I would expect to see uh, a more clear a right wing party with, with people, you know, much more pro pro business, right? Yeah. Uh, overall, I think most people are going to be more pro business because we've seen the uh, the other side, right? But but I would I would I would say still the majority of, of opposition Venezuelans, I would still categorize them as a center left people. Yeah. I don't think that idea that exists. I know we're all fascist. Like no, I think most people are really center left, and they still want the government to to provide you know cheap oil, cheap fuel, even if that's not really a progressive thing, but they think, you know, the people deserve free fuel because we produce the oil, right? Yeah, yeah. In, in that conversation that opened this podcast, we spoke about the relationship between the state and the individual. I think it was in a very fascinating way. And, uh, and uh, do you see this relationship changing in the future or do you expect that Venezuela is always to be this paternalist, is going to be in this paternalist cycle? Do you see any signs? Well, it, I don't know how it is possible to see any signs of this changing, but where do you see this going? No, I do think we, that whenever things change, I do think the, the newcomers will have to, will, will try to, you know, bring more balance and bring more uh, checkpoints to government, 
right? To basically, you know, going back 200 years to what the U.S. did after, you know, removing the, the British Empire, they, they put in place a bunch of uh, obstructions, let's say, to government. So, so government couldn't just do whatever it wanted. I do think Venezuelans uh, following Chavismo era are going to try to say, okay, yes, we still have oil. Yes, the government is going to be strong. Uh, probably, you know, federalism is not going to have too much of a, of a real shot in Venezuela, but uh, let's obstruct the work of the government a little bit so we, we don't have another Chavez, right? In what form that's going to be? You know, it's, it's always hard. There's, there's no magic solution anywhere, uh, but I'm pretty sure we, we're going to want to try to reduce the power uh, of the government. Look, my wife, uh, you know, I, I, every week I come to my wife. Uh, well, I'm joking when I say every week, but every once in a while I come to my wife and it's like, okay, now it's really going to happen. Like the change is coming. Like, it's really, and yeah. my, every time I say something about Venezuela, my wife is like, <laughs> she's already like, okay, stop. Like, don't, do you have hope? I mean, where are you at this moment in terms of the future of our country? Well, I don't have too much hope. <laughs> uh, I think we're in a very, you know, dire moment. Um, the, the thing is, the truth is that hope kind of rebound from time to time, right? Like in 2018, we said, you know, we're deep down, there's nothing else to do. And then 2019, we had this new push to, to remove Maduro and Chavismo, right? Uh, I do think that that could happen. I just feel that every failure... Uh, really sets of sets us back. You know, people stop believing. Yeah. People say, "I'm not going to go out again on the streets." You, you have new leaders, but they are, you know, burn out pretty pretty quickly because immediately if they fail, people, some people start saying, "Oh, you know, he betrayed us. He's part of Chavismo. He's this uh, colaboracionista. You know, this this guy he just wants to do business secretly." So, so I do think there's a you know a, a loss in confidence from the the population, and in this past you know, five to six years, we've lost five million of our population, right? So, so immigration became a, a solution to, to avoid, to, you know, to get away from the conflict. And, and that also leads to people from abroad sending money to the people inside. So that kind of protects you uh, mm -hmm. against a bad economy inside. You know, you get $50 mm -hmm. from somebody abroad, that helps, right? So so it's complicated. I think things are, are, are so bad, uh, you know, in world history teaches us that, at any point, something can happen. Um, yeah. But, yeah. but I, I, I wouldn't say, oh, 2020 is the year. I mean, I would say, no, it's not It's not the year. Yeah, right now it's better to stop thinking that it's even, even going to happen because, I mean, it seems like, well, but it seems like the change never arrives. And, and it's just it's just like the military seems to be so attached there and so well fed by the by the narco traffic that they're controlling. Is this a way, because I don't want to be conspiratorial. Uh, I would like to ask you a professional opinion. I mean, for me, it's pretty obvious that it seems to be that they are benefiting from something like that. But what is a more more serious opinion about why the military is so loyal to the government? What do you think that is? Well, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's probably the key question. Um, and I think we've, we've received many answers. The fact that the, the military is very well protected uh, I mean, in a way, it's protected by the government. In a way, uh, Chavismo just took over the military, right? Uh, uh, um, they they don't only you know get get their part of oil or get their part from Ill illegal the, the illegal economy, but they basically co-rule the government too, right? Uh, so so it's not like oh Maduro is screwing things up, let's put him out. It's no, we, we, they they are, they are all screwing the country together, right? So. I don't know. I think they're already so, uh, so, so, so one thing, you know, like, for example, let's go to, to Egypt when the, the revolution happened in 2011. You know, they said, okay, Mubarak was a member of, of the military, but there was some, some professional uh, military that said, okay, Mubarak is really yeah. uh, damaging our image. Let's put him aside and then, you know, okay, we have elections. Elections didn't go, didn't go you know, well for what they wanted. They put, the next day. But I mean, they had an image to keep. In Venezuela, I think from the past 10 years, the military is just basically, in a way, a synonymous of Chavismo. So they're, they're all in this together, right? I do think, that my hope, if, if we can call it that, is that things under Maduro would be so, so con will continue to get so bad and that even the illicit economy would not, you know, would not be enough for, to keep people happy in the military. They will say, you know what? we can remove him, not not bring Guaido, right? But bring like another Chavista that will be even more pragmatic, could change things. I mean, the, the problem is that my hope doesn't really open up democracy, right? And doesn't bring 
the people that, you know, somebody like me supporting. Uh, but I think that could happen. It's just that, like you say, so many things have happened that you say, wow, yeah. when is this uh, going to happen? Right? When, I mean, I, I really know, I'm not, I really don't want to put you um, in pressure with any kind of prediction because, I mean, of course, it's it's just mm. stupid. And, and but, but I would like to know your, your guess, your opinion. If there are fair elections, which that's a whole topic that we can go and discuss, but let's, mm. for a second, create a simulation that there are some fair elections there in Venezuela. Do you think Chavismo can win them again? Yeah, again, in a few years. Yes. Uh -huh. Not immediately, um, but in a few years. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm I'm sure they will win it. <laughs> um, not <laughs> not not with Maduro on, on as, as the face. I mean, I think uh, a change in Venezuela will mean, you know, the removal of Maduro forever, I guess, because he's not even really a popular. He was never really a popular yeah, guy. He was not just, even from the beginning. Correct. He was just loyal to Chavez, right? And to Cuba. Um, and so I, I do think Chavismo, I, I mean, I thought, I had a hope that that was going to happen after the 2015 elections when the opposition won a majority in Congress. Yes. I thought there would be some shakeup within the Chavista party. They would say, you know what, we can reform, we can remove some more of the extremist elements. Uh, we'll lose the 2018 election. Uh, but you know we'll we'll improve our image, and in 2024 we can we can win the election. I mean, people still have such a good image of Hugo Chavez. Sadly, uh, so many people in Venezuela. Uh -huh, Venezuela. That, that, but if you have you know if you have another somebody else governing, you know, like a President Guaido with actual power ruling the country, you know, the, things go bad two or three years in the economy, and and the support of Chavez that image goes from 35 to. 51% mm -hmm. without too much problem, right? You know, maybe they'll change the name of the party or things like that, but but I have basically no doubt that at some point uh, in a future democratic Venezuela, Chavismo or something like it is going gonna, is gonna to rule again. One of the things I wanted to to explain by making this series of Venezuelan-related episodes is that uh, the people that live in America and Canada and, and in the first world countries, when they analyze Venezuela, they have to really not see it in the context of a developed democracy because it, it would be foolish to do so. Uh, the question goes like this. Do you think that the separation between uh, the, between the political leaders and the state, the figure of the state, because I remember when I was living there, I was always criticizing the fact that I mean, that the police cannot be Chavista, right? Because the police yeah. is an institution, but the Chavismo is, Chavismo is a political party. So so um, do you think that this this uh, way of building a state preceded Chavismo or is something that Chavismo unleashed? I mean, Chavismo definitely un unleashed it. I do think in the, in the 40 years of democracy between 1958 and 98, there were real attempts of separating the, the ruling party from the right. state. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were, you know, very, uh, you know, I would say mostly independent institutions. I mean, the, the, the president could not just do whatever he wanted. Um, there, there was Congress most of the times in those 40 years. Uh, the ruling party didn't have a majority in Congress, so they had to negotiate with, you know, ADECO Pay and other minority parties. Um, and you had really more of an institution. I mean, the best example, I think, of that is that early in our democracy, when, you know, the democracy was still very fragile, uh, Cuban Revolution had just happened. We had members in Congress of the Communist Party who received, you know, two or three percent, but were in Congress because of uh, our, our respect for minorities, like minority yeah. vote could have represented. And those same guys went to Congress in the morning and then at night they just went to the woods, to, to the forest, <laughs> to be uh, guerrilla members. I mean, it, and that was known, like they were... Uh, guerrilla members and members of Congress, and, and still there was, you know, some respect. Of course, there were controversies. There were some massacres because, along the because way. Because they have some sort of parliamentary immunity, they couldn't be trialed right. or something. Ah, yeah, I didn't right. Know uh -huh. Yeah, and so and so, I mean, many things, many times, things like did happen, and, and 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 you know, I guess the 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 best and worst example is that the president uh, Carlos Andres Perez was removed by a Congress where his party had. Uh, the most number of, of deputies, right? He was investigated by the attorney general, and, and you know, and, and we had many cases like that of of the of the controller general investigating. Uh, so, so yeah, that for for sure the, the institutions were not uh, were not perfect. I mean, were not completely independent, and the, there was of course a lot of influence, especially from Acción Democrática, which was like the main uh, ruling party. Uh, you know, they ruled so many years that of course 
you know, the institutions had a, a smell of, of a day, of course, right? <laughs> uh, but it wasn't like, like now. I mean, there were career people who were, you know, 40 years in the, in the ministry and, and nothing happened. Diplomatic people that were not changed when, when a new government came, you know. And so I think it was uh, weird for the time in Latin America. And now I guess we are on the opposite side where you see many Latin American countries trying to have independent institutions kind of making it. And Venezuela is, you know, it's just a one one party state, not a one party government, but a one party state. I was, uh, when I was there, um, more involved, um, I was fighting a lot the, I was fighting a lot for the correct usage of words. I mean, when people started calling the regime dictatorship, for example, I was like, wait, 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 you cannot call it a dictatorship because it was elected democratically, something like that. Mm. Uh, I was not trying to be apologetic for the regime. I just wanted to be like same when the government started calling the opposition fascist. I was like, dude, but you cannot use this term like it's not the correct term for yeah. you. Is there like a moment when this became a dictatorship? Do you have like a like a precise or precise, a precise an epoch or a phase? But for somebody who doesn't know the story, how would I you do the... Yeah. I mean, of course, there, there's, you know, authoritarian characteristics from a long time ago, right? Yeah. I do think in 2016, when the the state, the Chavista state, basically blocks the possibility of a recall referendum, uh, for me, that's the moment that Venezuela started to be a dictator. Can you explain that? Like, like well, yeah. sorry, the recall referendum, what it is, because people may not know that. Oh, well, Venezuela... Ch the, the constitution that Chavez wrote, you know, well, wrote, kind of wrote, promoted, and, and the one where he, he, his project was really just to make a new constitution. That constitution extended the presidential term for to six years, but it allowed for a recall referendum at, at the half, meaning that if people gather a number of signatures, uh, there had to be a vote at the middle of the term, you know, three years into the, the presidential term to see, basically asking, do you want the president to continue or do you want the president to, to leave office, right, at the middle of his term, right? Uh, and so that, that has always been controversial. That's always, you know, a pain to call for that. It's, it's super manipulated. In 2016, the opposition had just won the, 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 a landslide majority in the, in the parliament, and they tried to call to organize this recall referendum, again, that it's in the constitution that Chavez created. And uh, all the, the electoral authorities Basically, I mean, uh, they they blocked it in a in a way that you know makes you laugh and cry at the same time. Like it was ridiculous how they blocked it, and, and that and that was happening just as the parliament, despite having a two thirds majority by the opposition, was not allowed to pass any law. Any law that the parliament passed immediately the next day, the Supreme Court said this is unconstitutional. So the, the parliament has never been able to pass a law despite having two thirds majority. Not even one like. Not even one law, like about tobacco or something like that. Like, I mean, nothing, so nothing. Stuff. Everything they've done has been stopped <laughs> by the Supreme Court, which eventually led to the Supreme Court saying, you know, uh, the whole parliament is unconstitutional, so don't even bother writing these laws, right? Okay, let's let's try to explain that. Excuse me, did you want it to carry on? Uh, no, I mean, so, so, so just saying that, you know, in at, around mid 2016, we had a country in which the opposition controlled the National Assembly but could not do anything with it. And the opposition tried to have this vote, which is allowed by the constitution, and was not allowed. So you say, okay, we don't have, at that point I said, okay, we don't have democratic ways to remove Chavismo from power, meaning we are a dictatorship. Yeah. We've tried it every way. We're, we're, I mean, I'm being very lenient on saying that dictatorship only started in 2016, but even being okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try, like you say, let's not exaggerate with the terms. 2016 is okay. After this, yes, it has to be a dictatorship. Like we cross the line. Because they really do not allow the opponents to change people in power. Let's let's replay this because I really want to put this in a way that everybody can understand. Let's replay this and let's do it. Let's change all the Venezuelan institutions and put it in America. If this would happen in the USA, how would it look like? Well, it's hard because the the, the presidential election here doesn't have the recall. Some states do have it, the, the presidential election. But, but it, let's say if, if that existed, if the constitution of the U.S. would say, you know, you can recall Trump or whoever is the president in 2018. Uh, so something like what happened. I mean, Nancy Pelosi. Wait, wait. And, and, you, should start, yeah. you should start with the election of the Congress. I mean, let's yeah, take correct. a step back. Yeah. And this really happened here. I mean, the Democrats won a solid majority, not a two-thirds majority, but a solid majority in the House of Representatives. Venezuela doesn't have a Senate. So let's say that Democrats won the House and the Senate, mm -hmm. a majority of both houses of government in 2018, and they would have the, the option to 
organize and call a referendum for Trump. Imagine that, you know, uh, the House passes bills and the Senate approves them, and then the Supreme Court immediately, like not even having like a normal process, immediately says, this is unconstitutional. It doesn't matter what it is. The opposition passed laws about, you know, owning land. They passed laws on, 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 on several issues, economic issues, political issues. They were all immediately the next day, you know, you see John Roberts, the, the Supreme Court, uh, mm -hmm. well, the Supreme Court justice saying, no, that's unconstitutional immediately after they say that. Uh, and so, you know, you have these polls would have, you know, the Democrats having 60% of the vote. They try to call a referendum. They start following all the steps that the electoral authorities say. And then the electoral authorities said, no, those, those signatures are all uh, fake. You know, they don't work. You cannot have a referendum. In Wisconsin, I mean, I know this is like a small thing. Something like four or five years ago, the state of Wisconsin does allow a recall referendum. It was, you know, a very polarizing situation. There was protest conflict all over. The Democrats were able to organize and call for the referendum. They lost it. But, I mean, things happened and people said, okay, the governor can continue. I mean, we lost it, so nothing happened. Like, the, people in the U.S. in some places know what a recall referendum is. They are able to organize it. They have the vote. They may lose or win, right? Uh, so that's kind of what, what happened there. Of course, the context, the context would be much bigger. Like, uh, th there wouldn't be, like, a, a Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the Supreme Court. Like, it would just be nine right. completely uh, Trumpian figures. N not even, like, the, the conservatives that, you know, there are now. Some people like them or not. But, I mean, I think most of them are serious and respectful sure. people. This would be, like, uh, I don't know, Mitch McConnell resigns one day from the Senate and he's appointed the next day mm -hmm. to the Supreme Court. I mean, we have very partisan people who just were selected to the Supreme Court, very partisan Chavistas, right, who, who are part of the of the Supreme Court. How does the Supreme Court work in Venezuela? Is it also a lifetime appointment? Like how, how... They have, a, I think, a 12-year term, so it's, ah, not, mm -hmm. it's not for life. But, I mean, going back just a second to that example, yeah. of course, all of this happens, you know, all of these bills that the Democrats are passing and the Supreme Court is saying that they're not valid, Uh, all of this happens. Meanwhile, you know, Hillary Clinton is in jail. Uh, while, you know, Joe Biden is in exile. Obama, you know, also in exile. Uh, I don't know, like Alexander Ocasio-Cortez is hidden in the, in the Cuban embassy. Uh, I mean, being persecuted. <laughs> this is also happening when uh, Andrew Cuomo uh, was, was uh, they removed all the budget from the New York governor's office and they put a guy on top of him. The, the guy who he beat in the election, They put on top of him with more power. So Andrew Cuomo doesn't control the, the New York police. He doesn't control anything, basically. And so you have a, a Republican governing over him. That, that's the context of, of the Venezuelan map. Right? So, so there is a shadow government always there running whenever there are some, some opposition victories. That are well, well, that, that's why I'm saying that, you know, I'm, I'm very lenient, or you, you are as, as well, I guess, saying that the dictatorship only started late, right? Since at least 2007, uh, Chavismo has, uh, has acted against an electoral result. So in 2007, the opposition won uh, a referendum on a change to the constitution. Yes. In spite of that, in the next two or three years, Chavismo uh, passed either through law or through new referendums. That was th the those things when they lost my vote. In, in, it mm -hmm. was then. I mean, for right. me, it was that moment when I was like, okay, but we already voted for this and you're repeating it. Correct. Mm -hmm. and, and they repeated the, the, the question on if, if, if a president could be reelected indefinitely, right? Uh, but all of, many other things that were rejected in the referendum to change the constitution, they just did it through laws. They just passed it in Congress, right? And then in 2008, uh, the, the opposition won, you know, important governorships, you know, Miranda, Zulia, Lara, which, you know, It's like New York, California, Florida, like big states. Uh, and they all, you know, the, 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 uh -huh. they kept the police in most places. But all of their, their budget that depends on them, like they removed the uh, airports and ports. Those were handled by the governors no more. Only in the states that the opposition won. So where wait a second. Won, they wait a second. Before the opposition won, the, the governors were had control of the airports. Once the opposition Correct. won, it was like, oh, no, no, wait. But Correct. how is that enforced through the military or... Yeah, basically, like, yeah, you, you're not handling this. The president just appointed me, you know, head of the airport of Carabobo, so you're screwed, right? Uh, the, the, the worst example is Caracas, because in Miranda, Zulia, they, they kept, like I said, the police, the fire department. I mean, they had some control to do something. The, the mayorship of Caracas, which is, you know, the capital of the biggest city, 
was won by an opposition figure, Antonio Ledesma. They took away even the office. The guy had to go to like a private building to have a sad little office because they took away the fire department, they took away the police, they took away every but health how, how did it work? Like he went to work and he was not allowed to enter to his own office? Literally. I mean, you can, you can try to search videos of that in YouTube. At some point, they just blocked him from the, the palace in downtown Caracas, so he had to go somewhere else. So he didn't even have an office. And he still had to pay a bunch of, of public employees, but he didn't have money. So, of course, those employees protested. I mean, so you say, <laughs> the worst part is that he, that, that was in 2008. Then he won re-election in 2013, but then was arrested in 2014. Why he was arrested? I think that was because of the episode of La Salida, which was a major protest in 2014. He was one of the leaders of that. And there's a famous video of the police taking him from his building apart apartment, and he's now in exile too, right? So, so that's like the story. Like Antonio Ledesma won the mayorship of Caracas twice. Never had power to do really anything there. He was stripped of all his power. Then he was arrested for being uh, in the protest, and then he escaped because he actually, uh, you know, drove to to Colombia. He probably, you know, paid somebody. I don't know how that happened, but he escaped his his uh, home prison. And now he's in Spain as an exile. Well, I just for, I just for a second I forgot the name of the mayor of New York. What's his name? I it just escaped. The, the Blasio. Ah, so the Blasio. It, it would be like the Blasio wins the elections, comes to work, and then yeah. he arrives to the to the entry of his work. There is a policeman there telling him, "Sorry, Mister De Blasio, you won the elections, but you cannot enter here." Basically, but but it's the Blasio as if New York were the capital, right? Because Caracas is the biggest city, yeah. Yeah. the most important city, and the capital. So it has like a big meaning. And like the, the the palace of the mayor of Caracas is you know right downtown across from the presidential palace, so it's like the big like like what happens in Colombia, like the mayor of Bogota is like this super powerful figure that's always like fighting with the president, right? Like it's the second most important political leader in the country. We had that with Antonio Ledesma, and he was completely you know just thrown into the street. And and another person, uh, in this case, it was a woman that was put on top of him, like like that position basically everything from that used to be of him was trans how, how does it works legally it's like they passed a decree a presidential decree or how how i mean i understand that this I'm is sure, sham but but yeah i'm sure they do i'm sure they pass some some type of law and i mean i'm, I'm sure there's something reaping about that usually it was just chavez saying and hello presidente oh now the police cannot be in the hands of this fascist so it's gonna be in the jacqueline faria and in 2013 the guy <laughs> oh no no i'm sorry no no sorry I was going to say the guy he beat became that person, but no, he, he didn't accept. In other states, it has happened that the defeated Chavista becomes this appointed position over the governor that defeated him. So, What do you think? I mean, how? what do you think that people who are apologetic to the regime, the question is a little bit like why and how at the same time? I mean, why and how the people who are apologetic of the regime abroad ignore these kind of factors? Is it because they don't make it to the news or is it because they believe that the news are, are fake? Well, I guess it depends on what level of apologetic you are, right? I mean, if you are somebody who, you know, love has a poster of Fidel Castro on your room, I mean, obviously you don't really, you know, you don't follow the rules of liberal democracy, right? Like you don't care, basically. You think everything is sham and, and the people's revolution is necessary or something like that. If you are, you know, like a leftist who... Who, who, you know, cares about democracy. I'm pretty sure most cases they don't really know because so many things happen in Venezuela and this really doesn't make it to the headlines. If they see it, they say, oh, I'm sure he did. He is a corrupt person, so he needs to be in jail. Uh, I'm sure some people would justify it saying, you know, well, obviously the, the, the mayor of Caracas cannot have the police because he's a fascist if they think he's a fascist. And so that would be a, a danger to the democratic national institutions. I, I'm guessing that that's kind of the how ju you justify, right? If you put the the opponents as the as the devil then you, of course you just have yeah. to remove the weapons from the devil like the, i one of the things i was discussing with Annika rostin was was connected to the fact that international media use a very particular wording to when they refer to guaido as as a political figure in venezuela as if the wording that they use didn't seem to to indicate that there was a constitutional figure that was there being followed and uh, mm. i admit that uh, again, as I said in the introduction to, to, to my podcast in general, I'm not an expert or anything. So when you're talking to me, you're kind of talking to the layman. So I kind of don't imagine, don't understand very well what happened there with Waido. first. I mean, let's talk about that. And also let's talk about 
about what happened there internationally. I mean, because there seemed to be a lot of support, but I still, whenever I open the news, I see self-proclaimed president, and I get confused. Mm. I mean, I'm usually, I usually defend the media a lot, right? I mean, it's it's hard, right? Like it's not easy and it's not obvious, so so it's hard to explain. So, and and also what what Guaido used, even though constitutionally, it's also you know, it's it's basically a a theory of of the like, okay, we we think this is uh-huh. uh, the appropriate. So so basically, what the National Assembly said is the 2018 elections were. were are void basically they're fraudulent right uh-huh. we cannot have uh maduro as president starting in 2019 because his victory in 2018 uh, doesn't didn't count basically right uh and so when that happens in many countries in the world i mean if you don't have a president uh the national assembly has to step, step in the legislature right right i see uh, and, and this week we can put it in other case like if a president is elected in november but dies before taking office in 20 in, in the next year in January, uh, then the legislature has to come in at least for a while, right? If a, if a presidential a president elect dies and there's no vice president, for example, yeah. uh, many countries have a new election, right? They have to do something else. So Guaido is an interim president because of that. He's I'm just here while we fix this issue, and we have a new election. That's why the constitution says you have to have an election in the next thirty days. But it's based on the principle that the 2018 elections were fraudulent, which is, I mean, for us, it's obvious, but for the world, because the world is interested in institutionality and continuity of the institution. So they are not interested in anybody saying things like that and just taking power. Sorry, carry on. Yeah. yeah no, no, but why do, six, why do 60 countries support Guaido? Like, why the major democracies in the world support Guaido? My inner leftist uh, um, bias. No, my inner leftist kind of like like little devil there says ah because they are in a plot to try to to remove Chavez uh, Maduro. Sorry. No, well the 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 response is really that twenty the before the elections of twenty eighteen and that's also like a big episode in this recent history of Venezuela. Before the elections in twenty eighteen, there was a long. Uh, dialogue process in the Dominican Republic sponsored uh-huh. by at least I think six countries uh, and you know and like the European Union and the United Nations had some sort of representation in that dialogue where the opposition and Chavismo were sitting down uh, and then you know they spent months negotiating and it didn't came to anything like basically Chavismo didn't accept any any of the demands of, of, of the international community and of the opposition, and so they just went along with those elections. That is why the opposition doesn't participate in the 2018. The, the main opposition doesn't participate in 2018 because we were discussing for five months with these people to have some sort of free and fair elections. They said no, so we said, well, we cannot participate. And the world was a witness to that. The world, the, the world you know, many countries were represented, were sitting down with Chavismo and the opposition in that table in the Dominican Republic, and they said, yep, there's no transparency, we cannot accept this result. Of course, uh, the, the issue, I guess, which makes it more complicated, that the elections were in May of 2018, but the president, this, the new presidential term only started in January of 2019. So basically Why? the world said... Why was so long? Because Chavismo moved the, the date <laughs> to May just because they, they, they wanted to screw people up, right? Usually they're in December, so the, the, the transition period is, you know, one or two months. They made it almost a year. Uh, well, like eight months, whatever. And so the opposition and the international community said, once this new term starts, Maduro is not legitimate. He's legitimate still between the election and the president because he won legitimately the 2013 elections. But as soon as 2019, the January 10 of 2019 begins, we cannot recognize him because we were in that process. We said we saw that the elections were not legitimate. Venezuela needs a legitimate presidential election. The, 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 where we are going with all of this is that we're trying to paint a detailed picture of the fact that this was never an, a, a, a developed democracy. And it was always a, a sham, a mess. Well, I don't have to call it a sham, but, but a very, very chaotic mess of things. When I was discussing with Daniel, because I want to take one step back. When I was discussing with Daniel Sierra in episode one, we talked about an episode that happened on the appointment of the Supreme Court justices. 
at the beginning yeah. of Chavez's mandate. It's something that even to me as a Venezuelan, it escaped my 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 retention of my attention. I, I didn't know that. Can you explain me a bit what happened there? It seems like early at the beginning of Chavismo, there was a manipulation to the Supreme Court that became key in the future, or is this not well read? Sorry. Yeah, well, I think th there's two things. The first thing is that Chavismo came in and wrote this new constitution, right? You know, I've been, in the past two years, I've been, you know, rereading what was happening in 99 in 2000, which, uh, just like you, I mean, things, I mean, I was a kid, so I don't really remember that. I remember things better since 2002. Uh, but really, 99, 2000, Chavismo already had us. Like, writing a new constitution was... Was right, but we must, to be fair, we must say that that constitution was uh, written under the, under a, under a democratic frame. Is it correct to say it? I mean, they won uh, the elections and... Yeah, least, I mean, you know. I'm not saying that there was a dictatorship and they had majority support, yes. I'm just saying that after writing a new constitution, Chavismo, you know, just had all power. Yeah. So basically, Chavez wins the election in 98. And something that people don't really remember is that a month before he wins, there were congressional elections. And Chavez coalition didn't have a majority. Mm -hmm. So when Chavez comes to power as this popular figure, oh, you know, larger than life, popular all over Latin America, Congress is is dominated by the opposition. The opposition has a majority. So Chavez cannot do whatever he wants. Always his project was to write a new constitution, right? Yeah. The only way to change the previous Venezuelan constitution was through Congress. Mm -hmm. We didn't have this process of, oh, let's just call for a, a vote and have a new, no, no. The Congress had to amend it. Of course, without having a majority, there was no consensus in the Congress to have a new constitution. So Chavez, you know, all the pressure, the popularity he had, he was pressuring, pressuring, pressuring. He wanted, and basically, I mean, it, it led to the Supreme Court of, of, of that Venezuela, of that previous Venezuela, to say, yes, you can have a vote to have a new constitution, which was unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. But the Supreme Court kind of made it legal, okay, have a vote. So then came the first vote saying, do you want a new constitution? 80% of the people said yes. Then came a second vote. Uh, who's going to be members of that yes. constitutional body? Chavismo rigged, you know, legally rigged that election. And um, What do you mean by that, legally rigged? Uh, well, they, they, they made, you know, elect, they made it, basically they, they set the rules of how those people were going to be elected. And they got like 55 or 60% of the vote and got something like 94% wow. of the members, mm, right? Mm, so mm. to write a new constitution, which, you know, it should be like a very wide group of people, diversity, everything, 95% Chavista. I think there were only seven members of critical to Chavismo. This was just the beginning, right? So Chavismo was still like a very, you know, not as, as clear as we have it now, but I think it was 110 members, only seven opposition. I want to I wanna make a small pause here to share with the audience something that I was feeling as I remember as a kid back then, you know, I come from this uh, world country, which is which is not a major player in the world, and uh, and the the whole thing was marketed and in, in the in the media of supporting all of this process of the constituyente and everything and and the change of the constitution and the future. I was really feeling that man, we're gonna be in space in like fifteen years. This is so grandiose. What's going on here? <laughs> what a disappointment that it all ended like that. I mean, many people like me could not read. I had so many friends who were telling me, man, this is going to end up like Cuba. And, you know, when I moved to 2012, when Chavez died, I remember calling everybody and telling, man, I'm sorry. Like, I, I really couldn't read it. For you, was this so clear from the beginning for your family? Or this is something that... Yeah, I mean, for my family. But I guess it, it all depends on your family if you're 10, 12 or 13, right? I mean, I... I wouldn't blame you, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm not saying, oh, I was so smart to see it. No, I mean, my father has always, especially my father, he was more like involved in politics. He was, you know, never a leftist at all. And he feared Chavez since the moment he, you know, led that coup in 1992. He's never liked the military. Uh, he never, he's never liked Cuba. So obviously everything smelled bad for him, right? Uh, and he... So from the beginning, I, I don't know if he said this, that was going to be Cuba, right? But in my house, of course, there was always a criticism of what, what was happening. And we were soon, you know, afraid of, of everything going on, right? And so so I guess it was easy for me because my, my family was always anti-Chavista, right? I, I do remember, like, in 98, I think, I asked my father a very wise question, actually, but back <laughs> for my age. I asked him, do you want Chavez to succeed? Because I already heard that he was so critical of him, right? Like, you don't want him as president. Cool, but if he question, wins, yeah. do you want him to succeed? And my dad was like, yeah, I guess I do, but I'm pretty sure he's not going to succeed, right? I'm pretty sure 
is going to turn out bad. And, and, and soon enough, we, we were already, you know, agreeing with, with my father, I guess. Today, today I heard such an interesting quote. I'm reading a book uh, by a guy called Jonathan Haidt. Um, the book is called The Righteous Mind. It's a really yeah. fascinating book. And, and today I heard this very interesting uh, quote within this book, which was, uh, when you study a handshake, you don't study only the right hand. <laughs> you just study both hands, right? Like how a handshake works. Um, and we talk a lot about Chavismo, but we don't talk about the opposition. Uh, can we can we explain a little bit to people? I mean, because one of the reasons perhaps why the country is not in a great place is because maybe there is a bad leadership, but there is also a bad opposition. Uh, do you have legitimate disappointment with the opposition as well? And, and uh, do you think that they are guided more by personal interest than by a country interest? Why are they not successful? Yeah. Sorry, Leo, can I... Got you can away make a pause, so please, please go, okay. please go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Rem oh, let's remind, like... yeah, no worries, no worries, no worries. Yeah. No worries, no sorry, go, go ahead. So we have in the first time in my podcast, I have a small pause where I'm alone. And uh, I would like to, to continue this debate on my own because where I'm taking Jose Alfredo on this is that I want to show to the audience that the problem of Venezuela, the, the main problem of my country is not just Chavismo. It's a problem of how the whole society and this whole world was put together. And that this is a problem that starts in 1492, as I was discussing in the previous episode. We were discussing about the fact that the name of our country most likely comes from um, intention to say that this was uh, non-fulfilled, not great quality Venice because of the initial architecture that the Spaniards found there. And then this place was a country that was where resources were hard to be found. And so it was not a powerful colony. And then this was projected to the present into a situation in which oil was found there and where oil was found in a place that had already a super weak economy. And then a democracy was instaurated in a place that did not have a historical, a history of institutions that had been in several instances been just decimated by the lack of coherence of its own society. And then in the middle of all of this, after 400 years of weak institutions, we had a larger than life figure that arrived to power. And this larger than life figure was, as I was saying, the other side of the handshake was an opposition party, which is, well, not an opposition party, but groups of opposition that could never really act coherently. And this takes me to the question that I'm asking per perfectly to you. So thank you're right in the precise moment because I kept 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 saying something like to some sort of background. I was uh, and I repeat the question I was asking you when you analyze a handshake, you know, the, the handshake has two sides, two hands. Um, and uh, it seems like the Venezuelan opposition has not been able to materialize the change that the government, that the people want. Uh, why do you think is that? Do you think that it happens because the opposition leaders act in self-interest and not the global interest or I mean, I guess that there are three factors there to talk. How hard is the grip of Chavismo to power? How bad is the opposition, right? Maybe two factors. And how weak is the international support to the opposition, perhaps? I mean, is this something that can be well to, like, welded together into something? Yeah, I mean, uh, personally, I, I, I also like, like the media. I, I usually defend the opposition. I mean, I criticize them a lot, but I don't blame them in most cases of having failed to remove Chavismo. I mean, I think most cases, at least in the past few years, it's just the situation is so hard that I don't know if alternative routes would have uh, been better. I think other people could be more critical. I do think the opposition was pretty you know, bad at the beginning of Chavismo. And I think that helped Chavismo consolidate power, that polarized the situation even more. I mean, we didn't do our part to try to reduce that polarization and and I think, you know, after 2006, six, seven, that Chavez had so much money and so much popularity, things were just a big, big uphill, right? And then we've been chased after ever since, right? And now we have half of the opposition in exile, in prison, or in hidden embassies, right? Um, of course, there, there's things that, that could be done different. I do think a problem of the opposition is that, uh, you know, Chavismo continues to be this such a strong uh, power that the opposition is always being divided, right? And and among those divisions are groups that you really doubt that they are legitimately 
opposition people, right? And so even now, 20 years after we see episodes like the one at the beginning of this year, where something like 15 members of the opposition coalition in Congress suddenly just turn their backs and, and, and you know, go against Guaido and, and go to the state TV and say, oh, yes, I can dialogue Tell with me, Maduro. Uh, if you can later expand on that, because I don't even know about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, in, in 2020, when, when Guaido had to start his second year as, as president of the National Assembly, a group, a small group of con completely, you know, irrelevant members of Congress, like people that we don't know their names. I mean, you know, the, they are relevant, right? But Randos, we don't know yeah. them. Yeah, like, like back, backbenchers, like they say in, <laughs> in, in, in England. Uh, they just basically took over the presidency of the National Assembly. Of course, supported by the National Guard, by the military, but by, by state TV, by Venezolana Television. And of course, they, they, they then they have been supported by the Supreme Court. So, of course, they were bought. They were, ru I mean, there, there were no rumors. Like some members of the opposition said, I was offered money to be with them. And I said, no. So, of course, they took money from Chavismo. So, even today, we have, we have to live with some people like that. And then we have people... I always tell this to Daniel, which is, you know, also a friend of mine. I think many members of the opposition, I don't know what percentage, but I think many, and again, this, this is going to sound harsh, you know, I, I'm in, in ex, I mean, not in exile, I'm outside of the country. Okay, I, I understand my, my privilege, I guess. Yeah. But I feel many leaders of many political figures, many elected officials have this mentality of the previous Venezuela. They really only want to be elected a local councilman in Apure. That's yeah. really what they want. They just want to be members of X party, wherever they can change parties. They just put on their shirt. They'll go around giving out shirts and giving out, you know, food and electronics to people. Come election day, they want to be the local councilman in Guasualito, Apure, mm -hmm. in Santa Barbara del Zulia. And they just want that job for 20 years. So the Venezuelan and opposition is fractionate, very fractionate, you would say. I mean, in a way, it's fractionate because, you know, so many losses will, will make you yeah. fight, right? And some yeah. people say we have to be more radical and some people say we have to be much we have to just go to any election that comes no matter the conditions of that election other people say okay what Guaido is doing it's okay let's try here let's try there and so it's 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 impossible to to have a really united opposition against so many defeats against so much frustration uh with a powerful enemy with the threat of of going to prison with this money offers uh for you so Again, it's not to defend them. I, I criticize a lot Guaido what has been doing lately. I criticize many of the of the mistakes that Caprilis might have done. I just don't think that a different path here and there uh, would have removed Maduro. I, I just cannot say it, that that forecast because Maduro is really well, you know, entrenched there. So, how how strong is that? When I was speaking again with Annika in the previous episode, she was saying that when she met Diosdado uh, <laughs> Cabello. She the room was immediately taken by Cubans, who were the security of him. Yeah. And uh, let's uh, try to, to to touch a little bit this topic. How how deep is the influence of Cuba in Venezuela? I mean, it's probably very very deep, right? And always hard to to tell exactly. <clears throat> I just think they occupy. I mean, what what we know, I guess, is that they occupy really key positions, right? So so the the, the military intelligence is supposedly, you know, probably dominated by Cubans. And that really makes it hard for a coup or for, for some military uprising to be coordinated. Because they because are loyal to Cuba or, I mean, because they're loyal to other boss kind of thing. Or... Yeah, correct. And, and I mean, you can you can say it's sort of like this mercenary thing. Like, you know, you don't care about what happens in Venezuela because you're not, that's not your, your you're, thing. You're just you're like, like a contract. <laughs> you're under a contract. Kind of. Correct. You're a contractor. You are here. You, you're told by your bosses who are also very powerful and very strict, right? If you if you go another way, they can kill you. They can put you in prison forever. Uh, and so you know to do that. You've done it in your country. So you're going to be there. We're going to take you there. You don't have any links to that country. And you're going to make sure these guys are not talking, right? These, these generals. Of course, it's been so long that I, I'm not really sure how many institutional members of the military continue to be there. Of course, there are people that are concerned about what's happening, wanting a change, even if they're not institutional military. Uh, but the military intelligence apparatus is, again, I say very likely because, you know, we don't have like pictures of them and we don't have like numbers, exact numbers. But everybody that comes out of the military just talks about how, how big is the influence from Cubans. And you were talking about that with Daniel. I mean, Cubans have been there 
you know, Castro and his brother and his people yeah. have been in power for 60 years. They know how to do this. They know how to win hearts, uh, despite everything that happens in their country. So they're experts in, in maintaining power. And Maduro is just, you know, one of them, basically. Not, not that he's Cuban, but he's a communist. I mean, he was, uh, he studied there. He, 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 he was, this idea that, oh, he was this a poor bus driver. Mm -hmm. No, he was a, a member of a union uh, purposely, thrown in, in the in the metro in the subway of Caracas to basically, you know, uh, write things up, to, to create chaos as extreme radical ideolo ideologue inside a union. So he didn't really want, oh, you know, better payment for bus drivers. No. He 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 got an education in Marxism to basically create trouble in this kind of institutionalized country. So that's his his we, we've always made this mistake of saying, oh he's this kind of racist also uh, mistake of saying, oh, he's just a driver. Right. No, I mean, right. if somebody goes from being a bus driver to a president, usually that's like, wow, yeah. great that he could he could overcome so much, right? And there are so many examples of presidents who had occupied, I mean, occupied simpler jobs in the past and Correct. overcame and, themselves. And, yeah. and in a way that's admirable, right? And, uh, also, and also perhaps desirable in some cases. I mean, because right. uh, because the person who is an elite and arrives and tries governing a country may not know very well what are the needs, the needs of the people below. Yeah, I mean, ideally he went, a person goes from being a bus driver to, you know, learn a lot about politics and policy right. and stuff and then become right. president. Maduro was just a union guy who wanted to create trouble in the Caracas subway. That's why he was there. He he wasn't like he wasn't necessarily a poor person who just got any job he could. No, he was he had a mission there in the metro de Caracas. So so again, they, they, they Cuba knows what he's doing in Venezuela. It's uh, Maduro. You know, it's it's not a dependency. It's just that Maduro feels like we should do what Cuba is doing. I mean, it's there's this love. And also, of course, they, they, both countries are useful for each other. Both governments are useful for each other. But, you know, Maduro and many in Chavismo really admire what Cuba has done. Yeah. Yeah. And and, uh, and, and I mean, and, and their relationship between Cuba and Venezuela has been slowly, you know, because I remember in a point Venezuela and Cuba integrated. I remember this. Uh, there was a moment when our IDs were used valid there. I mean, this was also there was some sort of regional integration there happening as well, not only at the higher stratus of government, but also at the population level. Uh, I think there is free freedom of travel in between both countries. Am I correct? This is something... I mean, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. Uh, it's possible. I mean, I'm, I, there's a lot of movement between two countries. I'm, I'm not sure how how many how much freedom Cubans will have to go to Venezuela, <laughs> but probably you can. You, before coronavirus, I guess you could easily go from Venezuela to to Cuba. A couple of days ago, I saw this um, meme. I, I was telling this in the previous cast as well, and it really shocked me. It was a uh, uh, four images. It was an image divided in four. Maybe you have seen it around, uh, and that each image was representing uh, a member of a different country. Like image one was a Colombian, and image two was an Argentinian, image three was a Brazilian, image four was a Venezuelan. Image one, the Colombian is saying, we have 20,000 cases of coronavirus. Image two, the Argentina says, we have 100,000 cases of coronavirus. Image three, the Brazilian says, we have 150,000 cases of coronavirus. Image four, the Venezuelan says, ah, you guys are counting. What's happening? Which really, I mean, every time I tell this story, I hear... I hear the immediate, you know, depression slash, I mean, it's, it's, it's a black hole that is created as soon as I tell this to a friend or to somebody that this is a reality, that, that we're so disconnected from the world. And this I want to connect this with the coronavirus crisis. Uh, are you very preoccupied about what this virus can do to Venezuela, considering all the circumstances, or do you think it can pass off? No, no, I mean, of course, concern, yes. Um, I do think... I mean, of course, I don't trust the government's numbers. Um, I also don't think, I also don't believe the worst, um, you know, the worst forecast from some people, you know, from opposition people or people critical to, to Maduro. I don't think, I mean, at some point you notice, like we haven't had official murder number, crime numbers in Venezuela for like <laughs> 15 years. And yet, you know, it's a big problem, right? You. You know people who have been killed, kidnapped. Uh, you see the morgue. You see the hospitals. You hear the stories from doctors. I mean, it's impossible to cover when when you have like we do like twenty five thousand murders every year, right? Um, if we get to something like atrocious, like twenty thousand people or ten thousand people dead, yeah, it would be impossible from coronavirus. To even if we don't know the number, we'll know it. Like we, yeah. 
we know, like we have, we'll have reports of people in, in the UCB hospital, in big hospitals in Caracas saying it's completely collapsed because of coronavirus. I don't think we've had that. We, we have had that. Um, the, 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 interesting, the interesting thing, I guess, is that in the first few days, the government was saying, you know, we have one new case, five new cases, no new cases today. In these past 10 days, you know, in late, late, mid to late May, they started saying, yes, 35, 71. 82, like, like they are, I mean, the numbers even told by the government are growing. So I do think it's just possible that it got later to Venezuela, just like we've seen around the world. Like it was low in the U.S. until it wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, a month ago, it wasn't really too big in Latin America. It's blowing up now. I think in Venezuela, maybe it's blowing up a little later. It's also true that we have been disconnected more disconnected from the world, you know? So if yeah. in, in Colombia, in Brazil, you know, you have so many flights, so many movement in the border. In Venezuela, we don't. We don't have people coming into the country as tourists or as anything. So that helps. In this case, that that probably has helped. Um, and, you know, credit to Maduro, I guess. He did tell everybody to wear a mask from day one. When the world was saying, no, don't wear a mask, a month later, the entire world was saying, <laughs> wear a mask. I, I'm sure that has had to help a little bit. So, I mean, he gets a point there, right? Sadly, but but sadly <laughs> to make him happy, but fortunately for the population, some effect that has to have had. But I think mostly the fact that we are isolated from the world. So we, we don't really have this, this a lot of movement in, in airports, in ports and borders. So that helps control the numbers. But again, it's growing now, even officially it's growing now. And once it gets to, you know, 50, 100 cases a day, it's really hard to control, of course. If the hospitals are a mess in Latin America, in Venezuela yeah. are much worse. So, yeah. so even if the numbers are half of Colombia's eventually, the problems are going to be bigger in Venezuela. I, I see an opportunity to cover something with you specifically because you're a journalist. Uh, how is the media landscape in Venezuela? Like, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm asking the question very broadly, but is there something like independence uh, of, of reporting there? Are there opposition newspapers let's inform our friends that had, don't know what's going on there kind of what's the story there is like, there are many independent journalists and independent uh media companies the problem is that they're mostly on on the internet uh you but you probably don't learn anything watching tv in venezuela anything wrong with the country i guess uh you don't learn anything really i mean paper the newspapers have also been affected by lack of lack of paper so the government for years has not provided paper to the newspaper. Why the government has to provide paper? I mean, why doesn't the market provide this? Well, uh, well, because of the exchange control that we ch said in the beginning of the of the conversation, because of socialism, uh -huh. uh, they, they need, I mean, this was, again, this was like five, six years ago. Um, anything you had to import, you had to go to the government agency to say, please give me dollars. I mean, please uh -huh. take these Bolivares uh -huh. so I can have dollars, so I can bring this so, imported paper. For small, pause, small pause here. Dear, dear friends from abroad, ever since Jose Alfred and I remember our lives, we had to ask permission to buy dollars. Uh, we have a currency exchange control since 2002. Am I correct? I think it was January 2003. 2003. Yeah. Uh, to, to, put you, to put this to the, to the, to the general audience, as clear as it could be, I once went to a house exchange to a, to, a, to exchange of uh, to a currency exchange house in Venezuela, and I came speaking. <laughs> this was so funny, man! And I came speaking English to the, to see if they would maybe illegally sell me some dollars or something like to see what's up. Like I mean, so people can understand. I had I had some bolivares and I wanted to change them to dollars, and I knew it was illegal. I knew it, I couldn't do it, but I went just to try just for fun. And then I went to a place and I said, hi, I would like to change these bolivares to dollars. And the, la the lady uh, said, no. And I said, what do you mean? And she wrote a paper, man. She wrote illegal, uh, illegal, uh, legal, no, illegal, yes. <laughs> So, so, so people, uh, because I mean, this is going to connect very, very, very closely with what you're saying. The government yeah. put a very tight grip of the economy by instaurating a currency exchange control in 2002 or 2001. And ever since then, to obtain dollars there, it's actually, it, it has to be go through a governmental agency, which means that if you want to import, for example, if you have a newspaper and you want to import paper or everything that you need to import from abroad, you need to justify why you're going to get those dollars. And that has been a way the government has controlled things. Let's carry on. Sorry, right. I, I just wanted to... No, and to bring it like, like you were saying before to the US, 
right now, Donald Trump, the president Donald Trump is fighting with Twitter. Mm -hmm. Imagine that Twitter needed, you know, new a servers. billion dollars, yeah, yeah, new servers. a billion dollars to buy computers from China or something. They have to go beg the Trump administration. Can you please give me, you know, a, a million gens or whatever? Because we need to buy. I mean, imagine that the dollar wasn't like the dominant. Yeah, like currency. currency. But we need this money from China. Can you please give it to us? And so the government has power to say, if you keep uh, harassing Trump or you keep silencing whatever you, you want to call it, uh, we don't we don't give you dollars. So the government did that with everything, but with the newspapers was, oh, you know, El Nacional and El Universal, which were the two big uh, newspapers, very critical of the government. We just don't won't give you new paper so you cannot print it. So like from a decade ago, uh, the newspapers have been really, really slim because they just don't have paper because they need the government to provide them with foreign paper so they can print. So even if you're super opposed to a government, you have to deal with the government at every level of your life in order to do anything, right? Yeah, correct. I mean, in, in many countries, you have to deal with the government somehow. You need a passport, you need right. an ID. But in this case, even if even if you're a millionaire in Venezuela, it's not like the government is not giving, I mean... Uh, gifting you or providing you with three dollars. No, you're just giving them bolivares for dollars. So it's not like the, the government was giving this present to the newspaper. No, they had the money. They just needed dollars to buy it abroad and they couldn't. So the print media, which has been very important in Venezuela for years, uh, from like a, a, at least a decade ago, has also been either bought by Chavistas, which has happened a lot also, uh, or just stops being sold in the, in the kiosks or in the kiosks. So everything has turned into digital. And, you know, access to internet in Venezuela is hard, it's tough, it's slow. Uh, even even so, there's several, I think, very respectable news sites that, that, that still exist. But, I mean, you need to basically really want to be informed uh, and to go in, into these news sites to, to, to learn what's happening. Right? Uh, do you think this has been a policy or it has been just a coincidence of, of, of being inept? From, from where? From, from the government. I mean, like, let's crack down the media. Or it's like, well, we have such an inefficient system that then everybody ends up not having paper. No, I mean, I mean the, the inefficiency, inefficiency is part of it. But, of course, they have had a, a, a purpose uh, policy to silence the media. I mean, 20, we just passed the May 28th. It was the 13-year anniversary since RCTV, which was one of the uh -huh. two big TV networks, went off the air, right? NBC... You know, Trump is tired of NBC and he says, you know what? I will not renew their license I'm to so be I'm so happy that you put broadcasting. it in correct terms because yeah. that's how it so, was. Yeah. Correct. I'm tired of these people in NBC. Well, of CNN, he's most tired of. But let's say NBC because this was not a news station. It was like they had sports, they had telenovelas, they had everything, right? I'm tired of these guys criticizing me. I know people watch them. They will, they will be off the air in six months. And then, you know, come November 2020, NBC, you cannot see it. And then NBC goes and tries to become a, a cable station, and then the government says, no, you cannot be a cable station of the air. That happened with RCTV, RCTV, 13 years ago. And then, you know, El Universal, which was the, the one of the two big newspapers, was bought by this, you know, shadow, shady, shady uh, untransparent group of business people. It turned into super pro-government. Uh, Ultimas Noticias, which was, it was always like a leftist newspaper. But it was critical, yeah. It was critical. They are completely propaganda now. The same happened with the TV station, Global Vision, which was, you know, a symbol of the opposition. Global Vision was the CNN. I mean, it would like be like Trump buying or CNN. I mean, from a journalistic journalistic perspective, I would say even 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 worse. Like, I mean, at some point, Global Vision was not really following the journalism standards, right? Because they were obviously opposition. But I mean, given the context, you say, well, thank you. Because everything else is super pro-government. He was like borderline Alex Jones. Uh... <laughs> well, not so much, but yeah. I mean, it was more like, like MSNBC. Like, you know they have like a clear I line, right? Know. But, you know, in a, in a fight against dictatorship, it's like, okay, this is more acceptable, I guess. In any case, yes, the government buys CNN and it becomes a, a second Fox News. That's what we have in Minnesota. So it has been... Uh, widespread, you know, and, and they even, there's a, a new site in Venezuela that is very hard for people in Venezuela to see it. Like they, if they write the name of that news uh, site, they usually cannot enter. They have blocked it in Venezuela. What's that site? Uh, El Pitazo. It's uh -huh. like Pitazo. The, the whistleblow or whatever. Yeah. Because they've been critical. They have some investigative reporting. Many journalists have been threatened, exiled. I mean, Armando Info, which is like a biggest investigative uh, site, all the journalists, well, I think not all of them, but most of them have had to leave the country 
So yeah, it's it's a policy to to silence the, the media. Okay, so in our in our in our checklist of uh, because I mean today we touched in, in in a way mainly the topic of socialism and the the left story, the left story of Venezuela, and we also touched the mom the our, our perceptions about this being a dictatorship. Uh, so let's carry on on the checklist because this will bring me to the next question. So we discussed already about the absolute control of the economy. We discussed already about the absolute control of the currency and chase control. So there is a funnel there that controls, that leads the government to control everything in the in the economical activity. Check. So we have uh, elections that were that were manipulated in the sense that the opposition parties were not allowed to run. Check. Uh, we have uh, Supreme Court justices being appointed uh, without any kind of checks and balances. Check. So that lead us to the next point in their check. Are there political prisoners in Venezuela? There, there is a name thrown around, which is Roberto Marrero. Uh, can we talk a little bit about the case of the political prisoners? Yeah, I mean, this is always complicated because, you know, you, you have to go to the detail to, to, to really say, okay, they are political prisoners, they are in prison because they, the government doesn't like them. Um, but yeah, the, there are. I mean, the, the Roberto Morales is really hard to tell what he did other than just being a close ally of, of Guaido, right? Uh, and he's been a year. And the problem is that even if you somehow find a way to justify his arrest or, or the arrest of a political prisoner, say, oh, no, I saw him throw in a rock. So he broke a window, you know. Uh, then they spend days and days and days. First of all, they usually disappear for like two days. Nobody knows about them. Nobody knows where they are. And then two days later, and that's unconstitutional and illegal, uh, two days later, oh, yeah, they showed up. They're in this prison, usually a military prison, which they shouldn't be, right? And then, oh, they have to go against, uh, you know, present themselves to a judge or whatever. They have to be taken to a judge. They don't do that. 10 days pass by, 15 days pass by, they're not taken to a judge. Oh, they have this audience, you know, six months into the thing, they have their second audience, they don't show up. Or the judge says, I'm canceling this. So is this constant, you know, threats and this mistreatment of, of the people that are the political prisoners? And you mentioned Roberto Marrero, which is a good example, of course. There's a, a current active uh, main um, member of Congress who is in prison who is uh, Juan Requesens. Uh -huh. he, he was arrested and they have immunity. But but the, one of these other institutions that we haven't mentioned, the, the Constituent <laughs> Assembly, which is like the parallel parliament said, oh yeah, remove the immunity from him and he was arrested. Because they say he was planning a plot against Maduro, he's there two, two or three years already, two years already in prison. A member of Congress, which are, again, have immunity. And just like him, many have had to flee the country to not be in prison. Others members of Congress have been in and out of prison as well. Uh, and there, are, uh, the, 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 the sad thing is that there, there are or there have been so many like anonymous people that have like tweeted an insult. They go to prison. Like a guy who, who once had a, a drone fl fly by a, a march, like a protest, to see how big it was. Yeah. That guy was arrested and spent like six months in prison. That, that was his crime, right? So. So that's like the saddest part, that at least we know Juan Requesen's name, at least we know Roberto Marrero. Some other people, we, we never knew like their names, why they were there, people protesting, just caught in a, in a, in a bad moment. There was a, a local councilman who was killed in prison. Still, we don't really know what happened. Pro I mean, he was probably killed. We, we don't have any transparency on that case. And those cases just keep adding up. And, and you know, you have Leopoldo Lopez who has spent eight years between either arrest or house arrest because in the in the trial they said that he was indirectly manipulating the people through through speech right so wow. is there freedom of speech in venezuela is there what is there freedom of speech in venezuela i mean if you compare like to cuba or to north korea more people are able to say more things in venezuela than in those places um but <laughs> i the, feel the, so the, great about that <laughs> Yeah, but there's always a threat. Uh, I mean, like the, the answer would be no, right? The, in the in the gray sure. area of the no answer, of course, there's people who continue to insult the government and they are free. Yes, because that's usually what this Starbucks socialist will tell you. Oh, well, I see this. Guaido is all the time speaking about murder. Yes, but Guaido sleeps every night in a different place. Nobody really knows where he is because he's hiding every time. He has this, you know, weak internet connection to make contact with everybody and at any point he could be arrested and all of these other people have been arrested at some point or threatened or sent into exile because of the government the, the news media has been closed because of bring critical the government so 
yeah, there is some way of people saying things. You may say stuff and you're not going to get arrested 100% of the time, but there's really no freedom of expression because you always fear arrest. By the way, maybe uh, I imagine that perhaps you have no answer to this, but, you know, just like the revelations of Snowden came out of, of the USA having a very la large infrastructure to spy on its own citizens, do you have any indication or feeling these are different things, I mean, like like a source or something or a feeling that the government is mass spying on its people or it has no resources to do that? I mean, I don't think they're capable of spying a lot of people. I do think, I mean, we know that they hear, record uh, private conversations of political leaders or business people because they usually put it on display on their later. state TV. Yeah, well, not even leaked. I mean, they, the the the, the no, state TV, the yeah. which is like a propaganda television, is oh look, Maria Corina Machado, you know, an opposition leader, was talking to this guy. Oh look, the words he's using. Of course, in a in a private conversation, you say stuff that you don't, you know, that you exaggerate or whatever. Sure. They just put private conversations on display. So yeah, the, so we know that they do it because they have shown us the, the recordings, basically, right? What is your, um, you know? I was I was very fearful to touch this topic or not because it can blow it can it can give people who are very supportive to the regime a possibility to dis dismantle what I'm trying to do, which is just to show a picture of Venezuela. But I want to know your opinion about military intervention. I mean, there there is this Suleimani bombing, right? Scenario the Sulimanazo. You know, you just send a drone, bam, and just uh, explode somebody. I mean, by no means I'm saying that this is something that should happen. I'm not inviting the American government to do it. I'm not uh, asking that, uh, proposing that this is something that should happen. I'm, you are a political analyst, and imagine that I am an American investor or a Cuban in, a migra migrated investor to the USA, and I want to understand what's the risk of a military invasion in Venezuela in terms of the outcome. I mean, is Venezuela a place where a civil war, in your opinion, could, could, could explode? How do you see that, that scenario? I mean, I don't know if civil war is the the term. I do think, I mean, I do think a military intervention would be um, counterproductive, right? Like, um, let, let's beyond the morals or the you know autonomy. Yeah, which we don't want. Country. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's go beyond that debate. You know, and you and you may have. I mean, people may have moral reasons. No, I don't. If we're gonna solve this, it's gonna be without the U.S. Whatever. Um, I think it wouldn't be successful i don't know if in the short term like i'm sure they would remove maduro in a day like i'm not i'm sure that would happen uh maduro himself but the structure that dominates the state is another thing right so i do think in a way it could become a sort of tropical iraq or libya yeah um and it could lead i mean i usually and this is like a strong thing to say but chavismo does have a lot of people with weapons who know how to use it and who are really committed to the project either for self-benefit or for for whatever reasons uh, so those people they, they live in i mean they're today in caracas and in many cities today right those people are armed the, the state doesn't control them they are chavistas uh, but they would be unleashed in a situation like that so i'm not saying they're gonna kill the marines entering i mean they would kill some yeah. they would lose against the marines but they would they are able to quickly commit a lot of atrocities against the civil population who wants a change. Do you and they that, wouldn't do it. Do you think that the establishment of Washington understands this? I mean, I think so. I, the thing is that I, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's not going to be an invasion. I mean, neither. Right? So, so, neither, and, and we don't want this at all. Yeah. And so so I do think that they they, 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 they think about it. I mean, I always... I mean, I, this is like an awful conversation to have. Yeah. But when, when things get really tense in Venezuela, we are used to seeing images like of these colectivos, which are these... The name we give to these armed pro-Chavista armed groups, uh, we see images of these collectives like banging on uh, on building door on the the las rejas, the, the, like the, the fences of the of the, the doors, fences yeah. of the buildings, you know, in like middle class areas or, or low middle class areas. And you see, you see people scared. Oh my God, what's going to happen? And you see that the military doesn't do anything. And you see them banging and banging on the door in the lobby. If Marines set food in Venezuela, they're going to go beyond the fence. They're going to go beyond the lobby. And most people in that building will not be able to defend themselves. That is really my short-term outcome of uh, military intervention. The Chavismo is going to say, yeah, we're going to, obviously we cannot stop 
the Marines, the U.S. Marines, we're going to lose. But in the meantime, we're going to create a lot of damage. They're going to regret it. We're going to be kidnapping people here and there. You know, and so some mother in Arkansas is going to have his son kidnapped and, and show awful videos from these Chavista groups who lost the power of the country, but they're still going to create a lot of things. And, and that's in the yeah. short term. In yeah. the long term, yeah. we could have like this, you know, Colombian guerilla, style yeah, guerrilla, guerrilla style. 50 years of bombings. And, and so you say, damn, like, I really want to get out of this government. But if but things can always get worse, which some people I think don't 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 think people think, oh, we hit rock bottom. There is no rug bar. Man. I mean, there is no, like, oh, it's been 20 years. Cuba I has always, 60. I mean, I always say that the history of Venezuela is the story of finding out that the basement has a basement, you know? Yeah. And, and I mean, I, we ha we've had a good, we ha we've had at some point good years. Um, but I mean, things can always get worse. We thought in 20, you know, 2006, things could have been worse. 2010, 2013, 2017. I mean, we have no fuel now in a country that produces oil and that's rich in oil. And things can get worse. There could be, you know, economically, even though how dire the situation is, it could be worse. And there could be more violence. There is violence now, yes. There's poverty now, yes. There could be more. So you have to really think, okay, we do have to be careful because things could get worse. Hopefully they won't. Hopefully they'll get better. But every decision you make could lead you to a worse outcome. And you have to say, I mean, it cannot be an option. No, we have to do anything because we cannot be worse right. than this. Right, because, always will. because sometimes to do anything means to burn the house because you have some some problem there and you want to fix it so you end up burning the house and then you end up with no right. house what is right. your I, by the way i promised you to let you go at a certain time and we're reaching that time <laughs> and uh, i want to take you close towards towards the end um what what uh i mean when you're sitting down and, and you and your work and you're kind of projecting the future a what do you what do you think is at stake in the next months what is important there that we should pay attention? And B, uh, to close it up, what is your favorite outcome to the whole situation? These are two questions well, separate, the questions. Well, the second one is easier, right? The second one would be, you know, either like Maduro resigning or they saying, you know, yes, let's have a, a very transparent election in three months or something like that. And you put, you know, bring on the UN, the European Union, they'll set the rules. I, Maduro, won't be a candidate. All the opposition can vote. All the the people the, the let's work so the migrants can vote. Um, you know that's that's a nice outcome. Very hard to, to see it happening. Um, but Let, let's let's then augment that. What is a more realistic possible scenario that you like? I mean, right now I'm not sure. I think at at some point last year I thought it was possible something like you know the military really saying to Maduro, you know you have to go. This is a mess. Uh, let's try to keep it, you know, clean and and pretty, uh, but we will go give power temporarily to Guaido, and he has to be, you know, very strict in his timeline to, to produce an election, and he cannot be a candidate or something like that. Um, and so, like, the institutional pathway, having mm -hmm. this, yes, military intervention necessarily, because the problem is that the military is part of the government now. We, we just want them out of the government. So the, the military intervening in Venezuela is really... They, they remove enough from power, right? That's why I don't like to call it a coup if the government is already led by coup right. leaders, right? Um, so I think that that might have been possible at some point. Uh, and they had they had an easy way out. They said, okay, yes, the election was a fraud. This guy's here. He doesn't want to take full power. He's interim president. The, the, the international community supporting us. I thought it was possible for a few leaders of the military to say, you know what? Let's just push Maduro. We'll have an election in six to 12 months. We'll be the heroes of the transition. Even if we have a bunch of narco traffic, illegal things on the back, we'll be forgiven because we are the heroes of the transition. Uh, so I thought that was possible. I don't think it's possible now. I think, I guess the kind of realistic forecast that I would, that I would think is kind of possible is that, you know, the military says, Maduro, this is a mess. You cannot continue. We don't trust Guaido. We don't believe him. We don't, you know, we're not going to work with him, but uh, we cannot just give a coup and remain in power. So we, the military, will lead the transition for a year or two, and then we'll have free elections. That sounds like a more realistic path. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think right now they, they there is like no trust in in going to Guaido for, for some. So, so mm -hmm. but the international community would accept that. Yes, anything 
me, me, but have, have elections. Me, know. as a, as a, again, as a person who is not involved in politics, I, I always have this fantasy or question. Why are not the super billionaires of Venezuela giving a lot of money to the military and paying them to turn sides? Is this a realistic question or... or... <laughs> I th I'm, the first thing I think it would be it would be hard to have those conversation and those money that money moved without people learning about it, mm -hmm. right? Also, probably a lot of the millionaires in Venezuela are members of the military, right? So, <laughs> so I, I think the problem is that the military people, are, like we were talking yet before, is that they are they feel they are it's already too late for them, basically, right? Right. And their only salvation is to remain. Uh, with the government and with the government and there's there's a lot of political theories about things like that it's usually related to religion or race right like in and i don't want to you know go down this rabbit hole but like in syria the military leadership is is you know religiously related to bashar al-assad so they know that if they're removed from power they're screwed right. so they have to die with him because being out of power means the other part of the religion is going to take over and we're screwed so we have to die with him I think in Venezuela, kind of that happens. It's too late. We cannot turn back. We don't believe Guaido saying there's going to be amnesty. We don't believe the U.S. They're going to kill us anyway. So we have to. So it seems out. like it seems like there is no other way out than rather than than the use of force. I mean that some faction of the military just using a premise like like honor, you know, and say, hey, what you're doing is dishonorable. Let's take over. Because I mean, if these guys are going to go down till the end and they are the ones who can tilt the balance yeah well and that 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 has what has been happening i mean in the past few years um we've had yeah. a lot of attempts of that you know people people criticize a lot the negotiations they say oh dialogue is just a way for chavismo to to screw us and we we keep going down that that rabbit hole and we keep failing the problem is that we've tried i mean we the opposition let's say i'm, I'm not involved in those yeah. <laughs> um has tried a lot of violent events too and they fail as well i mean and I, there's only six times in the past few years with the drone attempt i mean a drone tried to kill maduro it, it that was, was real true. it was real it oh, was yeah yeah completely real it just missed for a few well i think a couple of kilometers but <laughs> it would have killed maduro and like the entire leadership of chavismo and they attempted that and then there was this guy in 2017 who broke into a, a military Uh, well, place where they had a lot of weapons. I, I don't have the word in English. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and tried to steal them, and he was caught. And then the, we had the April 30 last year, where it was a more organized thing to give power to Guaido with the military and the, the Supreme Court support. Uh, the, then there was Oscar Perez, this policeman who yeah. tried to do this crazy plan. Then we had this this uh, mercenary weird attempt this year. We also had a, a rebellion in one barrack in Caracas in January of last year. I mean. There are signs that those many people that are desperate to change it, the leadership is not, right? So only if the leadership sees that sticking with Maduro is more dangerous to them than not sticking with Maduro, that's when I think they'll say, okay, this is going too bad. If we don't do this, we're going to be Libya and people are here are going to come and, and take our heads. So we have to remove Maduro now. We haven't reached that point. That's super interesting, really. I, I had not seen it from that angle. And well, what's amazing is that, I mean, we reach, uh, as it happens to me with all the guests I'm having in the show, what's amazing is that we have reached to a point when I have to let you go, but we haven't covered uh, the, the whole portion of what I wanted to talk, because just like I did with Annika yesterday, I want to leave a cliffhanger there. There are actors outside, right, from Venezuela. Like an example is this guy called JJ Rendon, right? Right. Um, and they occupy a role here. So... Do you think, I mean, I, I asked you before, and with this we're going to close it, what should we be paying attention now, kind of? Uh, do you think that this is going to be tilted more from forces from outside or from forces from inside the, co the country? I mean, I think the problem is that we've, the, the forces from outside have kind of had a major role in the past few years, from both sides, you know, like Russia, China, Cuba, Iran on the one side, the US, Colombia, Brazil, Europe on the other. Um, I think that the things to look at is to basically see, you know, if, if you know, this is going to sound harsh, but if Guaido can succeed at anything in the next few months, meaning, you know, any plan that he proposes, any march that he calls for, if, if any of that is going to have a response, they are trying to do this plan where the this interim government, Guaido provides a hundred dollars to, to people in the healthcare business and the healthcare world, I mean, to doctors, nurses, because of the coronavirus pandemic, yeah. to provide them with a hundred dollars ah, sent from abroad. I hope that succeeds. If that succeeds, I think it's going to be one small sign for people to say, hey, 
even despite being you know completely surrounded and with no real power these people are doing something that the the, the de facto government doesn't do so i think that would be important you know calls to to protest are, are tough uh so, so i don't know I, I, again i just want to some sign that that Guaido is still gaining power honestly at this point uh i don't think Guaido would be arrested for example because i think maduro knows that that would make him more important than he is right now right now he's in a sadly in a weak position with a lot of failures uh, being his fault or not i mean i, I don't want to i don't want to be too hard on him uh, but he's in a weak position obviously right so he's not going to be arrested because the arrest would raise his position again and the opposition. It would move us again to, to the streets or to, to, to the international coalition to say, you know, the world is very concerned with coronavirus. So it's hard to say to the right. U.S., Spain, Colombia, hey, you know, please remove Maduro here while you're fighting this virus that has killed your economy, right? Thousands of people and keeps killing your economy. So the next ones I think are going to be hard on that sense because the world cannot continue to maintain attention of course uh and so i think we have to see i want to see this you know positive sign from Guaido. again not trying to be too hard on him but if Guaido succeeds in in any of these plans in any proposal it's going to be important to just have like some sort of hope for next year the problem is that we should have uh congressional elections this year uh -huh. so let's be, for like, what congress <laughs> for... Well, for, for the one Guaido is leading, uh -huh. right? So, so even like, constitutionally, he should lose power at the end of the year. Of course, that's something to watch. Like, okay. what are we gonna do? Let's, let's make a quick, that? quick pause here. I, I promise you, I would let you go sooner, as I know you have to go. But, but I, I want to make another another explanation for people that reach to this point on the video. Imagine that there is the Congress in the USA. In Venezuela, the Congress is the House of Representatives, uh, and the, I mean Congress and Senate in one. Okay, just yeah. let's let's simplify it like that. So, uh, the the uh, Trump is president. Democrats uh, win the Congress, and then Trump is like. All right, no, let's change the constitution. And for this, we need to create a parallel Congress. And then that parallel Congress is giving power over the Congress that already exists. Is this what happened? Yeah, kind of. The, the, the even most bizarre thing is that that parallel Congress is there to write a constitution. So it's a constitutional convention, which actually the U.S. could have one. I think 36 states have to call for one, something like that. It's not uh -huh. easy. But they could have it to write a new constitution. But Chavismo decided, the Supreme Court, Maduro, you know, the people who have the, the guns basically decided that's that's above everything. That's above Congress. That's above Maduro. They don't have uh, a term limit. They don't have objectives to, they, they don't have, uh, you know, the, their, their power is basically enormous because they are, you know, the people's power. And so they, that's why they're acting like a Congress. It's been more, I think it's going to be three years this July they haven't done the constitution. They haven't done one article to the constitution. No way. It's just a sham mm -hmm. to have this parallel government. Of course, Maduro called for that. The opposition said, you cannot do this. We did not go to the elections. They put just any rules they wanted in those elections. Nobody knows who really is there. There's like 500 members. Diosdado Cabello is the president. So he rules supreme above any other institution in Venezuela with Maduro. Uh, and so they haven't done the constitution. And that's their, supposedly their only job. They haven't done it. They have discussed one article of the Constitution. So this this helps us to close the thing so well, because we started by asking the question, how Venezuela is socialist? And uh, I want to remind you that many people who start with this desire of improving the quality of life of the most needed uh, end up taking power and then end up grabbing a grip onto power. And then something like the Great Communist uh, Party of China or the Great Communi Communist Party of the Soviet Union is established in which there is actually a Congress where the party meets and it's a unipartisan uh, uh, venture. So yeah. if you want another sign that Venezuela is, a, uh, in this case, a communist country, you have nowadays a one ruling Congress that was put on top of the usual Congress that we, you, we had in the Constitution that is now the main legislative body of the country am i correct correct and so and you that, were saying and with this we go home you were saying that there should be elections for the usual congress the constitutional one and yes. what's going to happen with that i mean it seems like there is no what elections for what if that congress has no power will will the, the national electorate council give any kind of resources for those elections yes i mean they would do it because they want to screw why though right they, they want elections ah. they want the opposition not to participate they want to take away his the symbolism, right? And, and and that brings us to another one of the points that we talked about. Some members of the opposition say we have to go to those elections no matter what. Right. Others say, why are we going to go? 
they're going to screw us. They're going to, it's going to be a fraud. People don't want to vote. And even if we win, we don't have any power. So that's the eternal discussion. It's a, it's really a blackmail of yeah. what should we do? All the options are bad. Well, man, thank you very much. That was amazing. We have so much other things to talk about, so which is great, which means that we're going to repeat this again. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, thank you very much for your wisdom. And I'm sure that, well, we're going to keep you're going to keep us update with what's going on down there. Thank you. Thank you. And a pleasure for, for me to, to be in the show and to speak so long about Venezuela. Well, we will definitely do it again. So that's great news for both of us and for our audience. We will keep it uh, showing some light on this topic that it's very fascinating for us because, hey, in the end, you know, I was once in a bar here in Moscow and uh, and somebody somebody came to me and uh, I mean, because some people know who I am here in Russia and they were like, oh, Leo, like you're from Venezuela. Viva Chavez. And I was like, and I was really in the bad moment to be told that so uh, my wife almost had to catch me and i was really no well i, I was calm but but I, I really didn't react it so well and but but what i told to this guy was when was the last time when you went to your friend vanya's house ivan when you when was the last time when you went to your friend ivan's house and he said who is ivan and i said your childhood friend when was the last time you went to his house and he said the last time i went to his house was last weekend and i said well i don't have that none of us have that we all lost that and these are the population that migrated out of Venezuela. And you could argue, who cares about them? If you would argue that, you have no heart. Every single person who is connected to that country has been affected by this conflict. There is no way, either if you're there or if you're out, we all lost a country. And that is why I think everybody who has any kind of connection with it needs to do anything in our resource to try to push this idea forwards. You know, There was a revolution there that aimed to try to heal the poor from their from their bad conditions that created an absolute catastrophe that was like a slow motion civil war and that's where we're standing right now yeah yeah i agree hopefully that that person from the bar listens to this and is accepted of, of these ideas actually we became friends in facebook and and he has checked out the show i mean i i have i kind of found some sort of middle ground there and and i mean yeah. we, we healed it we healed it because i think that dialogue is always the way out and that i think it's a good way to finish this thank you very much man yeah Thank you. Thank you take, very much. Take good care, man. You too. Bye. Bye.